Hey buddy, guess what just came out? Zelda, a link between what? I beat it. How did you? Nintendo. 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 Yes. The Legend of Zelda, A Link Between Squirrels. Welcome to a very special episode of The Completionist. And guys, we have some friends at Nintendo that gave us a little sneak peek. And by sneak peek, I mean they gave us a game two weeks before it came out. And that game happens to be a sequel, or non-sequel, to my favorite Zelda of all time. Without further ado, here is our review of The Legend of Zelda, A Link Between Worlds. Is that in the uh, Mario World Stars pack? No. No, it's an, it's not. It's a brand. It's no. There's no series. It's a, a, a standalone game. Oh, it's in the Zelda pack, right? One day, I will fly to greatness. The Legend of Zelda, A Link Between Worlds. I don't think I've been this excited for a Zelda game since Majora's Mask. Nostalgia aside, I hope this game will live up to everything that this version of Hyrule stems from. But Vietman, you just completed Ocarina of Time and Master Quest. Why are you doing another Zelda? Shouldn't we be out exploring rock sculptures? One of the things I like about the holidays are new games. There's something really nostalgic about not only playing a new Nintendo game, but one from my childhood in the same universe. And Greg, we've never been out exploring anything ever in the history of our friendship. There's a simple truth that everyone needs to hear and understand right at the very beginning of this review. A Link Between Worlds is not a sequel to A Link to the Past, no matter how much they advertise this game as. It's as much as a sequel can be for every other Zelda game that's a sequel to the next. However, it does take place three to four hundred years beyond A Link to the Past. Since I am one of the first people to complete this game, there will no doubt be a thing or two I may or may not miss. If there is something I miss, I will make a follow-up video to go with it. And I know a lot of you guys are worried about spoilers, but honestly, at this point, if you've played one Zelda game, you've played them all. We get it, we get it. But just in case, we're gonna reference quite a few things from A Link to the Past. So, watch our review of it! Now, right off the bat, for the first time in a long while, I am not going to rename my character from Link to Snitches. The reason being is that with some recent Zeldas, they've actually instructed you to leave his name as Link like it's intended. Nintendo, if you want us to name him Link, don't give us the option to change it. I'll live to glitch another day, I suppose. Our story starts out the same as it always does, a dream. Link dreams of the Triforce shattering into millions of pieces, with Ganon possibly returning. Now in this instance, what ties the worlds together aside from the physical location is the fact that Ganon in this world is the exact same Ganon we sealed away in A Link to the Past. Link wakes up in his house and must scoot off to work as he is an apprentice to the blacksmith. Upon his arrival to work, the captain of Hyrule's forces leaves his sword at the blacksmith. Link is then asked to return the sword to the captain at Hyrule Castle. Once at Hyrule, the guard informs him that the captain has gone to the sanctuary. As we meet our old Ocarina of Time friend Dampy and Ceres, the priest's daughter, things go awry as someone is inside the sanctuary. Sneaking inside, we meet our villain Yuga, who from the beginning is way more creepier than Agrabah ever was. Yuga has this Kefka slash Joker vibe going on where you clearly can see he's not about the jokes, but rather the destruction of a kingdom. Shortly after, Yuga imprisons Ceres in a painting and takes her away. Link attempts to stop Yuga, but simply runs into a wall and knocks himself out. When Link comes to, we find ourselves in Link's house with a new visitor named Ravio, who looks an awfully like a man wearing a Nabbit costume. Nabbit? From New Mario Bros. U? Yeah, Ravio needs a place to stay, and since he's kind to Link, he asks Link if he could post up. 
Link being the wise and extremely talkative protagonist we know, lets Ravio stay, and Link is given a smelly weird bracelet. From there, Link runs to inform Princess Zelda of the tragic events from the Sanctuary, and it is right here where Link learns of the ancient hero of Hyrule, Ganon, and the lineage of Zelda. Yuga the Evil Clown Man is capturing the seven descendants of the Sages in order to free Ganon. While we enter the first dungeon with ultimately nothing in hand, we have our first real clash with Yuga, who clearly is overpowered. Yuga then uses his magic to trap Link into the wall like a painting, and it all seems over for Link. Except that Ravio's bracelet wasn't just a bracelet, it's an ancient relic from another world that will allow Link to turn into a moving painting. Before we move on to presentation, I do want to skip ahead into the story a little bit as to give you guys some more information on the dark form world we will be venturing into. So if you want, click here to skip. If not, then don't click. Like previous Zeldas, getting the three pendants lets us get the Master Sword and attempt to stop Yuga from taking over Hyrule Castle and turning Zelda into a painting. However, it's too late. Zelda's now a painting, Yuga has turned the Seven Sages into paintings, and Ganon is now free. Not only is Ganon free, but Yuga merges with Ganon, becoming one evil powerful beast. We are then rescued by Hilda, who looks a lot like Princess Zelda. Hilda? What is she German? See, in A Link to the Past, our plot was not to let Ganon get the Triforce, or else he'll try to take over the world, and the mirror allowed us to travel between regular Hyrule and Dark World Hyrule. In A Link Between Worlds, with Yuga Ganon reigning terror, a world called Low Rule is now merging with Hyrule. Low Rule is a completely different world, but because of Low Rule's currently depressing state and being overrun with evil, it is merging with Hyrule. From here, I think you guys can piece the rest together. Rescue the Seven Sages so that Link can unlock his true potential as the bearer of the Triforce of Courage in order to save Zelda, Hyrule, and Low Rule. You know, Gerard, there's actually a third world in this game called Ja Rule. Let's go! Menage! For this being a brand new 3DS title, holy crap does it look impressive. The 3DS does not output in HD, but it is outputting in a full 60 frames per second, which makes the game look that much more smooth. This is the first game on the 3DS where I've actually turned on the 3D because it looks so wonderful. You'll find yourself lost in the visuals. One thing this game does not lack is heart. You'll be fully immersed visually from start to finish. If you guys do see stuttering or frame skips in this video, it's not the game, it's my video capture device. This game is all about nostalgia overload while bringing a lot of new features to the series. The world is insanely well developed. It challenges you to remind yourself of the journey you once had in A Link to the Past, and it encourages you to push yourself forward to discover new things in a world you knew really well. The nostalgia chord gets struck so well when the game starts. The start screen mimicking that of A Link to the Past. Using the bottom screen, you've got a nice accessible map. And atop all this visual eye candy off, the music. I cannot express how wonderful the music is. It will pull you in every single time a crescendo is heard as the main Hyrule Field theme kicks in. And the game does adapt to other Zelda soundtracks as well, while maintaining the nostalgic core of A Link to the Past. You should have called this section, Nostalgia. And while the visuals and music are fantastic, the game does suffer every now and then from a lack of detail in character faces. Link at times eerily looks like a no-faced sprite, and every now and then the game actually will chug a little bit on transitions, making you think you broke your game. But these issues are very far and few between. A Link Between Worlds stays true to our understanding of previous top-down Zeldas and improves older conventions subtly without making you get mad for changing things. Cause change sucks, don't change a thing! First, a real big change comes from Ravio and your house. Ravio turns your house into a shop where you can rent items. Now I saw a lot in earlier reviews that this actually bothered a few people as they felt that it took a bit out of the adventure of finding an item in a dungeon. While that may be a valid point to some, it quickly becomes moot as you still find tons of treasures on your journey. Ravio here will let you rent all the items that you're used to in a Zelda title. The bow, the fire, ice, wind, and sand rod, the bombs, the hook shot, the boomerang are all items you can rent from the beginning of the game. It's kind of cool walking into a second dungeon with different items. 
Renting items simply gives all of your items the little Ravio symbol, and when you die, he collects a debt on all the items you rented from him. But don't worry, you can purchase all the items from him directly after the first three dungeons. The second big change is the limit rupee from 999 to 9999. This change, although it appears small, makes a really big difference as you will find a lot of use for your rupees. Each rupee is more meaningful than the next. It means you can rent or buy items, play mini games, donate to fairy fountains, maybe buy the golden bee if you haven't found one yet. A great change to elongate your experience in Ja Rule. Shifting gears back to items, the third real big change is item consumption. In all Zeldas, you are used to having a certain number of items or magic uses per bar. Those mechanics have been tossed aside for a more unique stamina meter, which is much more mainstream. This meter regenerates automatically, which really challenges you when it counts. You can't just spam arrows like crazy in order to defeat a boss. You can shoot a few, but then you need to evade to let the bar regenerate. This is a creative way to limit item management and focuses in on more action-oriented gameplay. The fourth big change, obviously, is the painting mechanic. At first, I thought this was kind of weird and dull, but I quickly learned how awesome this mechanic is when I needed to think outside of the box. If I can't hookshot or bomb my way through things, then it's time to become a painting and scurry along the wall to make it to my destination. Each dungeon and or mini area to travel to makes for a fantastic tutorial on how to use this mechanic. Check it out! Speaking of dungeons, the fifth big and final change is the dungeon order. If you're anything like me or my YouTube buddy Pcol44444, whenever you play A Link to the Past, you're always looking for a more fun and creative way to obtain items earlier by simply playing any dungeon you'd like. That's actually a big component of A Link Between Worlds. You can play almost any dungeon in any order you want. I say almost any because the Desert Palace requires you to have the Sand Rod, which you cannot get until you free a particular Sage. The freedom to play any dungeon in any order you want truly lets you optimize your time. Want to get the upgrades for the Master Sword early? Then visit the temples that have the Master Sword Ore, so you can have a then fully powered Master Sword by the 4th Temple. A real appreciated change that does not undermine the average player, letting them experience the game in any way they desire. Now the bottom screen is your main asset for swapping out items, but for me, the best thing about the screen is using it as your map to get all the heart pieces and collectibles. For instance, let's say you find a heart piece that you cannot get because you lack the ability or item to get it. Drop a pin on the map at that location to remind yourself later so that when you do get that item or ability to get the item, you'll know there's a heart piece that you missed. Also, you can hang the map on your wall with all those cool pins and reflect on all the cool places you've been. Actually, you can't do that. Despite this version of Hyrule looking the exact same as the one from Link to the Past, a ton has changed. Zora's River is no longer around, the desert to the southwest cannot be explored right away, yet the nice thing about this familiar world is that even though there are so many changes, there are a few things that haven't been touched, and you are rewarded for remembering them. Remember that E.T. cameo in A Link to the Past? How could anyone forget that lovable little alien chap? E.T. gave us a bottle for visiting him. If you revisit his hiding spot under the bridge in A Link Between Worlds, he is no longer there unfortunately, but there is a bard there who will give you a bottle. There are even a few heart pieces as well that have not changed locations, but they still require you to use different means to acquire them. To go alongside this, there are tons of side missions and mini games that will help you on your long-term quest. Maybe it gets you a heart piece or a bottle, perhaps some rupees. It all depends on the ramifications of the situation. My favorite in all of the game has to be the Tower of Treachery in Low Rule. Battling your way up the tower could not be any more satisfying as your game comes to an end. While this next element isn't new to the Zelda franchise in recent years, it is to the new version of Hyrule. The Mamiya's Mamma Mia, the Mother Mamma Mia. Mother Maya Maya looks like a huggable auto rock that lost all of her children. She's lost 100 in fact, and it's up to you to save them all. Yes, this is the Skulltula equivalent in this game, but she gives you a map that gives you an idea of how many are in that particular quadrant. You can find them if you're listening close enough, hearing little baby chirps. And for every 10 you collect, you can upgrade one of the items you own, and these upgrades make a massive difference. Upgrading the bombs makes you get a bigger explosion. The bow and arrow now shoots three instead of one, 
and the fire rod shoots a massive wave of fire. You get the idea. You may think you know the old Hyrule and the dark world of Hyrule, as well as the thug world of Ja Rule. But this one is pretty different in regards to dungeon design. The only dungeon that's even remotely the same is the very first one, with the first room just being like the marble balls rolling down the hallway. I can assure you that the dungeons are fresh, well thought out, and they emphasize that you have to take your time to explore all of them individually and very carefully. A lot of enemies have been recycled from previous titles, but they've been doing that for years in Zelda. Some of the bosses are recycled as well, but they've been altered and changed quite a bit to really demonstrate some of the new tactics you must employ. Now the big problem with this game is that the bosses are pretty easy. None of them really pose a threat, and the dungeons are a tiny bit shorter, or they kind of feel like it. I was foaming at the mouth for more bosses and more dungeons. Now there are these optional rupee dungeons, but they're more like big puzzles rather than actual quests to fight enemies and bosses. The street pass functionality in this game is one of my favorites thus far in any 3DS title. In your journey, you may stumble upon a shadow link or two standing out in Hyrule Field in various places. Approaching the dark link will then prompt a fight in which you will go versus one on one with another player. And these fights are really fun depending on the situation. Most of the ones I fought have been bots, I think, as no one else has this game. There's 50 achievements that go along with the Street Pass function, and unfortunately, I cannot complete them at this time because, well, no one has the game. But like I said earlier, I will make a follow-up video once I do so. Maybe you can put a follow-up in the next episode of the Mario All-Stars Collection Pack! Don't you mean Zelda? Nope. After getting all the items, including the bottles, the weapon items, the mamias, the tunics, the heart pieces, master sword upgrades, and you've collected the seven portraits and rescued the seven sages, it's time to storm Low Rule's castle. This last castle is really fun, as it pushes you to use everything you've learned throughout the whole game. Also, the red tunic is in here in this dungeon, and it's very easily missed, so don't forget it. Before our final fight with Ganon, we learn a bit more about Hilda and Low Rule. Low Rule was once a beautiful kingdom that had its own Triforce. Hilda's ancestors decided to destroy their Triforce because of the fact that it caused a power hungry war amongst their kingdom. After destroying the Triforce, it turned Low Rule into this corrupt, desolate, and evil land. And Hilda turns out to be the entire cause of what's happening to us right now in Hyrule. She was working alongside with Yuga to kidnap the Seven Sages and force Link to obtain the Triforce of Courage so that they can rebuild their homeland. This is probably one of the better plot twists to come from the franchise as it seems like she really was a nice person. Yet it doesn't really matter here as Yuga Ganon betrays her and wants to destroy both worlds. Time to bring it on. Show them no mercy because you know that they were responsible for E.T.'s death! Halfway through this fight, Zelda gives Link the Hillian Blessed Bow, which is used to defeat Yuga Ganon. This one-time mechanic use is pretty cool, but I wish I'd gotten this bow earlier. It would have been fun to find other uses for it. Oh well. Shortly after Ganon's defeat, Link frees Zelda, and judgment has come upon Hilda and Lowrul. That is until Ravio shows up. Ravio reveals that he actually is the hero of Lowrul, yet he was too much of a coward. Yet seeing him and being with Link has inspired him to want to be the hero that Low Rule deserved. Hilda realizes what she did was wrong and sends Link and Zelda back to their world. As Link and Zelda touch their Triforce to restore Hyrule, they make one big last wish together to restore Low Rule and give it its Triforce to its former glory. Happily ever after. E.T. He'll be back someday! Finding all the Maya Mayas not only gives you all the weapons in their super upgraded form, but it also gives you an upgraded version of the Spinning Circle Attack, which takes up half the screen. This move is known as the Great Spin. Really worth it if you're climbing the ranks of the Tower of Treachery. Speaking of that Tower of Treachery, for completing the tower, you will upgrade your lantern to the best of its kind, and even the Bug Catcher's Net to the best of its kind, only if you do it twice, and apparently, you can kill people with this net. Don't believe me? It's actually an achievement in the Street Pass game. 
For beating the game, you unlock Hero Mode. Hero Mode is the exact same as the original game, except that you take four times the amount of damage. Now, this sounds bad, but knowing you can kind of choose your dungeon order really makes this journey quite a breeze. Unfortunately, beating Hero Mode only garners you bragging rights. However, while I was recording footage for this review, I think I found some information that everyone's been dying to have regarding a Majora's Mask 3DS remake. In Link's house, Majora's Mask can't be seen on the wall, which is just a fun reference. You can even merge within the wall and act like you're wearing the mask. See? There's the remake you've all been asking for. But this is where it gets kind of fun, and mind you, this is just a theory that I myself put together. I noticed that when you visit Link's house while in low rule on the back side, there's a bottle, right? We all know that. Well, you don't, but you will soon. There's an empty desk on the far side of the room that you really won't pay any attention to. However, if you play Hero Mode and visit the house to get the bottle, there's Ravio's journal there with the entry labeled Three Days to Go. Now, in this journal entry, it sounds as if Ravio is lamenting about not intervening with Hilda and Yuga's plan to overthrow Hyrule. But the Three Days to Go seems a little too coincidental in the house that has Majora's Mask. And in the journal entry, the relationship between Hilda and Ravio seems a little too romantic. But already being the game, we know that they're not that romantic. The journal entry seems to really focus about that love affair. The entry goes on to have a headline entry for every passing day. Three days to go, two days to go, one day to go. I don't know, I'm sure I'm wrong, but we'll find out more in the upcoming weeks as everyone plays the game and develops their own theories. A Link Between Worlds isn't that difficult, nor is it that long, but it's definitely entertaining bit by bit. For me, the struggle of completing this game was just the simple fact that there was absolutely no resource material to help me if I got lost. Luckily, I know my way around A Link to the Past like the back of my hand, and that really prepared me for this game. Hero Mode is actually quite easy, but it does take a lot of patience. All in all, when I played this game, I completed it three times. Once for my first playthrough, which I died a few times, second for my Hero Mode playthrough, which I died quite a bit, and the third time for recording purposes as I just got my 3DS capture device a few days ago before this review. And while Gerard completed the game three times, I completed watching The Fast and the Furious 2 to try to figure out why they thought it was a good idea to cast Ja Rule in it. I still have no idea why they did. The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds for the 3DS is not only one of the new games in recent weeks to really surpass the hype, but it blew me away on all fronts. Sure, my love for this game did stem from the nostalgia blindness of A Link to the Past, but I've been obsessed with this game for the past two weeks, completing it over and over and over again. This game has risen to the top in my top three Zelda games of all time, with a very, very, very close second to A Link to the Past. Say what you want that I have my blinders on when it comes to nostalgia, but this game is perfect in my eyes. Retro gamers will really appreciate where this game comes from, and new gamers really appreciate where it's heading. With that in mind, guys, this game gets my completionist rating of Complete It. Complete it! That's all the time we have for today, guys. So as always, leave your thoughts in the boxes below, as well as your suggestions for the show. A very special thank you to Nintendo for sending us the game, and to everyone out there who donated to us getting a 3DS capture device. These things are expensive, and a lot of you guys spoke. You really want 3DS and DS reviews, so... Here you are, you're getting them. You know, if you really appreciated what they did, you would play the All-Stars pack. You would at least finish it. I mean, you owe it to people to finish it. How many episodes? How many episodes do we have to do for anyone at home to realize there's more episodes of the All-Stars pack than there probably are of the games? I, Come on! I think, uh, I think it's about 12. Like 12? Now, if you excuse me, I'm gonna beat the crap out of Greg with this stupid haircut. I mean, it's not that stupid, it's actually better than before. My hair is a shark.